Welcome class to the osteology PowerPoint. Um, this goes over roughly chapters six, seven, and eight in your textbook. Uh, you'll cover a lot about the bones and the names and the um, structures on the bones in lab. So this will be more about the functions of bone um, and a little bit more about how bone develops. So we'll start with the functions of bone. You can read through these. Uh, it helps with support and protection, movement of the body, Hemopoiesis is blood cell formation or red blood cell formation and storage of mineral and energy reserves um, like calcium and it also uh, serves as a reserve for energy in the body. So here are the classification and anatomy of bones that you will most definitely spend a lot of time going over in lab if you haven't already. Uh, long bones are greater length than width, though so an example with this is the femur. Short bones are nearly equal length and width. Uh, flat bones are extremely thin surfaces like in the uh, skull bones, your parietal bones. And then irregular bones have complex shapes. So you can see we have some short bones in uh, the wrist and in your ankles. Sesamoid or kind of irregularly shaped bones but a sesamoid shape. And then we have irregular bones like your vertebra in the back. The general structure and um, gross anatomy of long bones, which you should be extremely familiar with, hopefully here and also in lab. The articular cartilage is a thin layer of hyaline cartilage that covers the epiphysis regions. And the epiphysis regions are the ends of the bones. You have a proximal epiphysis that's close to the point of attachment to the trunk and a distal epiphysis that's further away. And the uh, articular cartilage just helps to reduce friction and absorb shock in movable joints. You have a medullary cavity, uh, which is a hollow cylindrical space within the diaphysis, which is this long part of the bone. And it, in adults, it contains yellow bone marrow. Uh, the metaphysis is an area where we have this epiphyseal line, um, which is where we'll have a growth plate. And then we have spongy bone and red bone marrow, which is where um, hemopoiesis which will occur, which is the formation of red blood cells. And then you'll also have nutrient arteries traveling throughout bones because bones are vascularized. They have blood flowing through them. The end osteum covers most internal surfaces of bones. So the end osteum covers most of the internal surface. So you can see it inside this medullary cavity here. And then the periosteum is the dense irregular connective tissue covering that covers the external surface of bones, um, except for when there's articular cartilage. It's anchored to the bone inside by what we call perforating fibers, and those will be embedded in the bone matrix. And you can see these perforating fibers kind of sticking out here through the, from the periosteum. Uh, the periosteum acts as an anchor for blood vessels and nerves and it will contain osteoprogenitor cells and osteoblasts, which will build bone. And you can see some of these cells within the endosteum there. Other cells of bone uh, we'll go through now. Osteoprogenitor cells are mesenchymal stem cells that can produce more stem cells or osteoblasts. Osteoblasts form more bone matrix. So I usually use the hint that osteoblasts build bone. And osteocytes are your just normal functioning bone cells. They'll reside in lacunae, which are spaces that house them. And they will maintain the matrix and detect mechanical stress on a bone. And osteoclasts will be large multinuclear cells that will dissolve the bone matrix. They'll release calcium. And I also use the little hint that osteoclasts will kill bone or break it down and osteoblasts build bone or form new bone. Uh, compact and spongy bone. Compact bone is solid, dense. It forms the external surfaces of long and flat bones. The spongy bone has what we call trabeculae in it. It looks like a sponge, this open lattice of narrow plates, and this will form the internal surface of bones. And you can see how they look differently in this picture here. The compact bone microscopic anatomy. Uh, so we talk about the basic structural and functional unit of mature compact bone is called the osteon. And the osteon is in brackets here. It kind of looks like the rings around a tree trunk. 
Um, it's also known as the Herversion system. It's a cylindrical structure and it will travel parallel to your diaphysis. So it'll just run up and down uh, the diaphysis. And we'll go over the parts in um, the bone as we look at it under a microscope. But you can see here, you will have um, blood vessels running through perforating or Volkmann's canals. Here we have spongy bone. You can see lamella or lamellae are just the rings around the central canal in the osteon. And if we zoom in on this bone, you can see how the osteocytes, the bone cells are in the um, lacuna, the spaces that house them. And each ring is called a lamella. And the lamellas travel around uh, the central canal in the haversion system. So the central canal is at the center of the osteon is what all your blood vessels and nerves will travel through. Concentric lamellae are rings of bone around the central canal. Osteocytes are bone cells that are in the lacunae um, between the concentric lamellae. And canaliculi are tiny little interconnecting channels uh, that extend between the lacunae. They allow the osteocytes to connect and communicate. So you'll see these tiny little channels almost like spider um, legs coming off of the osteocytes and they will connect the lacunae to each other just to allow those osteocytes to, commu to communicate with each other. Perforating canals run perpendicular and help connect multiple central canals together and this is where your blood vessels and nerves will travel through. Circumferential lamellae, these will be rings of bones immediately internal to the periosteum so you can kind of see them here. They run the entire circumference of the bone and interstitial lamellae are just leftover parts of osteons that have been partially reabsorbed. So here's the compact bone model as we would see it in lab. Um, you might be tested on pictures like this, depending on what you're going over in lab. And this bone model kind of shows the same things we just went over, but how they would look on a model in lab. Spongy bone does not have osteons. It has those sponge-like structures called trabeculae that contain parallel lamellae. And how do bones develop? Well, osteogenesis is bone beginning and ossification is bone forming. Um, this is the process of bone tissue formation that leads to the formation of the bony skeleton and embryos, bone growth until early adulthood, and then bone thickness, remodeling, and repair throughout life. So ossification is the formation and development of bone. And we have two patterns, intramembranous and endochondral. Intramembranous develops from mesenchyme, which is a type of tissue. This will produce the flat bones of your skull, facial bones, mandible, and the central portion of your clavicle. And endochondral ossification begins with what we call a hyaline cartilage model. That just means that it starts with hyaline cartilage as it begins to form and this will produce the majority of the other bones in your body. So here's endochondral ossification. It's the fetal hyaline cartilage model develops in the fetus. Cat cartilage will calcify and a periosteal bone collar will form. The primary ossification center will form in the diaphysis region of the bone and secondary ossification centers form in the epiphyses regions. Bone replaces cartilage as it grows, except the articular cartilage, which will um, maintain, will be at their location, and the epiphyseal plates, which will be the growth plates. And epiphyseal plates will eventually ossify and form what we call epiphyseal lines. So this is a look at endochondral ossification, beginning from a fetal hyaline cartilage model. As it grows, how the deteriorating cartilage matrix eventually forms a primary ossification center, um, eventually forming into developing compact bone, a medullary cavity, um, the epiphyseal plate, and eventually into a mature adult bone. Quiz yourself. You can use the, these questions um, to kind of review what we just went over and to also maybe review some of the things that you're going over in lab, but use this slide to quiz yourself and you can pause the video here to do that or download the PowerPoint and go back to help answer the questions. The epiphyseal plate morphology, um, it's a layer of hyaline cartilage at the boundary of the epiphysis and the diaphysis. So this will be the site of interstitial growth and the growth of bone 
as it occurs in length is referred to as interstitial growth and this will occur in that epiphyseal plate. And if a growth in a bone occurs at its diameter, or gets thicker, we refer to a bone's growth in diameter as apositional growth. And this will occur in the periosteum or the exterior layer. So this is a look at long bone growth and remodeling growth. Bones will grow because cartilage will grow here and then cartilage will be replaced. Cartilage will grow here again and cartilage will be replaced by bone. Remodeling occurs as the growing shaft is remodeling where bone will be resorbed and bone will be added by apositional growth and then resorbed there. Epiphyseal plate cartilage, this is bone growth in length. It occurs in what we call the epiphyseal plate region. And there's zones that these um, bone cells will grow through beginning with um, resting cartilage to proliferation, to hypertrophy, to calcification until we get to ossified bone. Um, growth in bone, it stops at age 25. And between ages 18 to 25, the epiphyseal plate completely closes, so cartilage cells will stop dividing. Um, but again, these five zones of the epiphyseal plate begin with resting, then the cells proliferate or increase in number, then the hypertrophy or increase in size, and then they'll become calcified and ossified. Apositional growth is bone growth in the diameter. So you can see here uh, where bone is resorbed by osteoclasts and how bone is deposited and how the growth um, increases by diameter of the bone. Blood supply and innervation. Again, blood is highly vascularized, meaning there's tons of blood vessels going through it. These are the four major sets of blood vessels that go through bones, and nerves will accompany blood vessels through the nutrient foramen, which is just the hole that they'll both go through. Effects of exercise. Exercise is also good for your bones as well as your muscles, but mechanical stress will stimulate your bone to increase osteoblast activity to build more bone, and bones of athletes will become thicker and stronger as the result of repetitive and stressful exercise. Uh, bones, though, do lose mass with age, so it's important to continue to do weight-bearing exercise, especially in females who come across um, problems with um, osteoporosis later in life. So weight-bearing exercise is very important to help slow or reverse bone uh, mass loss. Aging of the skeleton, um, bones will change by losing their ability to produce more collagen, which will help to create cartilage, which will help bone growth. They will lose calcium and other minerals, and this can result in a decrease in bone mass, which is what we call osteoporosis, and that can increase the chance of bone fractures or bone breaks. So this is a look at what normal bone looks like. Um, it's just really solid versus osteoporotic bone, which has, it just looks more fragile and kind of delicate to it. Here's osteoporosis again, another look at normal bone versus osteoporosis. And this is a look at how you can see osteoporosis parotic bone in an x-ray, especially around the hip region where it often affects um, the elderly. That's why when uh, grandma falls and falls, she usually breaks her hip because it's an area of osteoporosis. Achondroplasia is also known as dwarfism. It's caused by a mutation in a gene. In normal development, this gene, FGFR3, has a negative regulatory effect on bone growth, but in a Chondroplasia, the mutated form of the receptor, is constitutively active. So this leads to severely shortened bones. Um, it's inherited as a dominant trait, but 80% of cases are actually due to new mutations. So where neither parent has um, this mutation. So you can see here dwarfism, the extremely shortened bones. And we, you might have recognized this couple from the TLC. And then this famous uh, character from, I can't think of the movie, Austin Powers, I think, if you're that old and you've seen those two. Uh, this is a look at the bone uh, hormones and their effect on bone maintenance and growth. Growth hormone is important, thyroid hormone, calcitonin, tones down blood calcium levels and inhibits osteoclasts activity. Parathyroid hormones increases blood calcium levels by encouraging bone resorption. Sex hormones are important in bone growth 
especially during puberty when they're released, um, glucocorticoids, and then our vitamins that are important for bone growth. Vitamin A activates your osteoblasts. Vitamin C is important. And vitamin D, if you think about vitamin D, you always tell kids to drink their milk to get strong. Well, vitamin D promotes absorption of calcium and phosphate into the blood, which the bones will need to become calcified. And that is the end of this PowerPoint. Good luck studying. And as always, let me know if you guys have any questions.